Hello, this is Jerry Temple. Today I'm going to be giving you a presentation of the airplane that's in Farmington, New Mexico. It's a 1981 414A Ram 7, which is 335 horsepower. The original airplane came out of the factory with 310, so we've got additional horsepower on each side. Certainly good. This is the Chancellor. It's made from 1978 to 85. I think just a handful in 84 and 85. None in 83. That's a test question. Be ready for that. No twins were built in 83. So the majority of the production will be 1978 to 1982. Give you a few general features of the exterior and we'll later in this presentation hone in on some of the specifics. It's the long wet wing airplane. No tip tanks, no ox tanks with the wings, no wing the cell locker tanks or nacelle tanks, which is the correct nomenclature. It's just a long wing, the longest wing of any of the twin Cessnas. And sometimes when they have winglets, which this one does not have, we can nickname them as AW, 414AW, which even extends the wingspan. So often in purchasing a Chancellor, which is the marketing name, simply a marketing name for 414A, you have to really be conscious of the wingspan. As hydraulic landing gear versus the electromagnetic on the tip tank airplanes goes up and down real fast, zoom, zoom, and it has a blowdown feature. We don't crank it down. There's a 2,000 pound nitrogen bottle that blows the gear down if it wouldn't extend in normally. And we also have high gear speeds, VLO and VLE. We'll talk more about those. Huge baggage compartment up in the nose. You'll bulk out before you wait out. Heated pilots, windshield certified, no one eyes. Three-bladed heated props, big, huge vertical area. Lots of good features in the Chancellor. Some people think the 414A with Ram 7 is the best twin Cessna made, and I'm sure some other twin Cessna owners might politely disagree. What we'll do here is we'll go up in the cockpit now. I'll turn on the avionics. We'll look through and go through some of the stuff. Then we'll slide ourselves back into the cabin. I'll try and point out some features, and then we'll go outside and I'll point out some of the features I just referred to a moment ago. So... Excuse my voice, I occasionally have a little bit of a voice issue. I didn't take these photos and no one shoots perfect. Sometimes you can't control the weather that particular day or more likely where you got to position the airplane. You don't own the airplane port and sometimes FBO and owners can only help you out once or twice. This looks pretty good. I think this is in Albuquerque. Uh, the owner of the airplane in Farmington was nice enough to fly it over to Albuquerque. And JTA sales associate Rachel Schwartz, who lives here in the Dallas area, traveled to see this airplane. And, of course, you can talk to her about more specifics. I've not seen this airplane. I sold an airplane, another 414A, for this particular customer about three years ago. We were going to sell this one also. They decided to keep it as a backup to the King Air and Pilatus that they have. It hasn't flown much in the last year or so. The reason why the other two airplanes haven't needed a backup. They've been pretty good airplanes. So that's why we're now selling it. Maintained in Part 135 and a detailed comprehensive maintenance list is available in addition to the logbooks that we've scanned. Okay, let's turn on the avionics. Here's a full panel picture, a little bit of flashlight, or camera light bounce. Don't worry about it. We'll hone in on some of these. As you can see, we have a 750 and a 650. Audio system is part of the 750. Let's just work ourselves from left to right. You can see the enunciator panel, the basic flight instruments, flight director HSI, electric altimeter, airspeed turn and slip, mode selector, yokes look in good shape. They don't need powder coating or leather covering, but that's an easy thing to do. I see a radar altimeter. In the center there is a fire protection system, the cell fire system, graphic engine monitor, GPI 760, shade and digital fuel flow, co-pilot instruments, the quadrant, of course, throttle props, mixtures, all your trims, Cessna 400V autopilot with yaw, great visibility from the airplane, short people can get real close, Cessna seats adjust significantly, you can come raise the seat high and get real, real close. And tall guys can lower the seat and slide them back quite a ways. And we even have some magic features that can help out some tall guys more with some foam adjustments in the seats. Okay, let's take a closer look at the pilot side. A little bit better shot. Again, you can see the Davtron 811B digital clock. The eyebrow has been modified. You see the holders for the pencils or flashlight. That's a nice feature. Enunciator panel is different color lights to show you warnings, advisories. They're not all warnings. Some are just advisories or advising a system as operational. Airspeed indicator looks like a true airspeed indicator to me. 
electronic altimeter so we'd have a backup barometric on the other side or someplace. Vertical speed, HSI, which displays the number one, which is the 750, and I suspect we'll find someplace, and there I see it under the clock, the uh, CDI with glide slope for the number two, 650. Red altimeter, still nice to have, nice tight approach. You see the DME also under the turn and slip. Still nice to have a DME. I can compare it to GPS direction. VORs aren't always on the airport. They're going to be a few miles away or part of the approach sequence or missed approach sequence. Yokes again look good. See the Chancellor emblem. Throttles, prop, mixtures. Pretty good fire system like this. Here's again a little bit closer. You'll see that placarding is real nice. I'm kind of a nut for planning or uh, placarding, excuse my language. Looks real good. So whenever the centerpiece, you can see that centerpiece of gray metal was recut. So let's just go across the top. Manifold, RPM with prop sync, shading, digital fuel flow, EGT, three-in-one instruments, oil pressure, oil temp, and uh, Oil, oil temperature, cylinder head temperature, and oil pressure. Those are the three. Call them the three and ones of the clusters. You see some outside electricity there, so your ASB ports. USB, I said ASB, but you meant to say USB. Fire system, 750, 650. Looks very, very nice. I really like the placarding. Looks real good. Very nice and clean. Go full set of co-pilot instruments. So let's just go to the top again. You got some pencil cylinders. You can clearly see the RAM modified because this is a RAM 7. Oil pressure, oil temp, and cylinder head temp. Got them all right. Good placarding. Electrical power, fuel quantity. You see that both in pounds and gallons. We also have a DME readout there, which is on the, above the attitude indicator. Propeller heat is that little small, about the size of a quarter. Full co-pilot instruments, airspeed, attitude, barometric altimeter that backs up the electric one, DG, turns, vertical speed, and an hour meter, and you see some jacks. The circuit breakers you see on the lower right are sort of avionics, things you don't mess with very much. And to the left of the yoke, you see the flap switch. Nice close-up of the quadrant. The red T-handle you see to the left of the throttle is the blow-down bottle. It's a 2,000-pound nitrogen bottle. Again, blows the gear down if we need to. It's one shot. To the left of the gear switch, you'll see the green toggle switch for your air conditioning. And right above that is the Cessna altitude alert, uh, alerter and uh, a warning system. It's, a, it's an alert and a pre-select. That's what I was trying to say, pre-select and alert. This isn't the script that I'm reading. I'm just kind of looking at it and telling you what I think. High gear speeds with the hydraulic gear on the Chancellor, the, the 414A. Put it out at 176 with the tip tank airplane. You got to slow down to 140 for VLO and VLE. So normally you you keep the airplane straight, reduce some power, get down to 160. Put out a notch of flaps, then continue to hold that so you don't exceed that. You're trying to get down to 140. With the Chancellor, if you get a have to come down in a hurry, you can put those out at 176. Put the gear out at 176. Put the gear out. Put the flaps out and come down at a high rate, and the pressurization will keep up with you. 400V autopilot, and you can see to the left of the autopilot head, the yaw damper. Just turn them on right after takeoff, give you a little less wiggle waggle. And before landing, I turn them off. The cow flaps, what you see at the very, very bottom there, and a hand microphone and all your trim switches. There's the electric elevator trim that looks like it's cutting behind the left throttle. The reason that throttle is fatter is that's part of the go-around mechanism. If you got to minimums on approach, you hit a little button that's on the side there with your thumb, and you get a pitch up on the attitude indicator. So we have elevator trim, manual and electric. Then you have your underneath autopilot is your yaw, the rudder left, right. And then you will see the little knob that's again to the left, to the bottom of the quadrant, looks like a little knob. That's your aileron. It's very sensitive, very sensitive fast you go. You notice the scuff plates on the floor. That's real, real nice. And this airplane has a fairly recent interior. Some people put some down some plastic mats in case you spill some coffee. To the left of the, excuse me, to the right of the uh, flap switch are some of your heat outlets, defroster, cabin, cockpit. And behind the prop switch, prop switch, prop levers, your, your those little switches are your rheostats for lighting. Just there's about seven or eight of them. 
This is the, the side panel, as it's called. What you see on there is the suction gauge at the top, the green arrow, the, the indicator that's in the green is oxygen, and then your pressurization controls are above it. We'll talk a little bit more about pressurization in a bit. Then you've got four mags, which is those, those looks like blue or black from here. And those two fat chrome switches are metal looking or your aux pumps, that's mod MEB88-3 that changes the aux fuel pumps. The four mags have something we call a gang bar, allows you to turn off things in a hurry. And then that's gang bar number two. Gang bar number one is the one you see in the up position with the batteries on and they have two alternators. The rest of the switch is in white and red and I've got all kinds of colors, blue, yellow, green. And we also have some circuit breaker collars. You see a yellow one on there that we can identify systems that we need to turn off like in a hurry. And sometimes it's autopilot or flaps or gear or just different things and we can coat them with yellow or red or green and so forth. It looks real nice. I think it's time to go back in the cabin and point out a few things. Well, start with, shouldn't have too hot of seats or too cold of seats to the sheepskin. Gray seat belts, it looks like, and leather on the side and the shoulder harnesses that you can't see, but they're there. Nice, look good, it's fairly new. Believe it or not, at the top of the screen, you're seeing a good old ashtray. Most of the time, those have been converted to uh, uh, intercom plugs, but back once upon a time, somebody might have been flying with their Havana cigar all lit up, believe it or not. We're looking forward. You can see the rose and sun visors, they're a real plus. And you see the cabin dividers, we call them hardwood forward, hardwood cabin dividers is the nomenclature we used at Cessna and I'm still using. Some passenger advisory signs you see on the right one, no smoking, fasten seat belts. The emergency escape hatch, exit hatch is there on the right by that aft facing seat. Seats number are as follows, pilot one, co-pilot two, aft facing left, number three, aft facing right, number four, the door back, forward facing left, number five, number six is forward facing on the right side, sometimes called the boss's or spouse's seat. Potty's number seven, and some airplanes, not all, will have the eighth optional seat. This one does not. On the left side wall, you see one of the intercom jacks. We have a six place intercom system, plenty there. You'll notice the armrests in the center aisle up. This is the 421 style seat that was put in and allowed for this 414A. So when takeoff and landing, the tables and the armrests for pilot and co-pilot and all the passenger seats are down stowed, obvious reasons. You want to make that aisle as wide as possible if you had to get out in a hurry. So takeoff and landing, everything is in the down position as far as seat belts, and, excuse me, as far as armrests goes and tables. I believe the tables in the refreshment center for weight reasons have been removed from this airplane for part 135. They are available, we've confirmed that. Repeat, they are available, they're just not in the airplane. So cabin divider on the forward side, intercom system, sixth place. Leather looks real nice, two tones there as you can see on the back side. These are adjustable, so as you'll see these, these seats go forward, slide forward and aft, and then there's a recline. They don't go vertically up, but this is a real wide seat. So if you have some people who are wide-bodied individuals, the seats in the, the armrest in the down position, well, the seats are wider to start with. In addition, the armrest in the down position give them a little more comfort. But some of the original 414s and even 414As, the standard 414 seat, the center armrest is fixed. It can be removed, but it's fixed. That's one of the reasons this 421 style seat is popular. Close up, looks real nice, good leather. You see the intercom on the right in the handle for the escape hatch. Should be opened and tested on every annual inspection. It's a good idea to maybe bring the family down and just practice it one time. You only need to do it one time and know how to do it. And hopefully you never do it. Looks good, very nice upholstery. You can see why, the reason again why we would want to have the armrest, both pilot and co-pilot, which are stowed at the moment, but you can see them, and the passenger armrest in the down stowed position. Notice at the top there, the monorail system is for this, uh, for the Rose and Sun Buyers. That's an extra cost where it's not just a swivel at a base, it's a monorail system. We're looking aft. The reason why we're probably seeing somebody's face or somebody, that's a mirror on the back wall. If you don't like it, it can be taken down or just covered up with some type of fabric or leather. Seats look good. Again, the armrest, the armrest on the inboard or in that position. I'll describe this as kind of beige looking leather sometimes. The beiges and the light grays are hard to tell. 
Still has curtains in it. A lot of people like those, but you can take them out, save them, put them in a plastic garbage bag for the next guy. Side panel, as it's called, has a fabric on the lower. The carpet probably comes up a third of the way. That's common. So that's one third, and the next one third would be fabric. In the top area, there is leather, which matches the seats. Even if it doesn't match the seats. For every seat, every seat is fresh air, oxygen, and a reading light. So you see them there for the two aft seats, and you can sign and see one by the door. There's the upper cabin door extender. That's the old deal that lets that door open easily. And there's a lower one also, I believe, I'm looking for, and I think I'll see it in another image that allows the lower door to go down easily. Clamshell style doors. Headrest adjusts up and down. Seats go forward and aft, and they do recline the back part, so your lumbar. Now we're looking back at the back end, and that's the baggage area that you're seeing. If you look down at the placard, you'll orient yourself. You're looking to the rear now, but and that's the mirror you're looking at. That's why you're seeing the mirror. You're seeing the back of some of the seats. Items you want in the airplane, I always say food, toys, games. Pressurization is 5.0, so about, a, say, a 20 or 21,000. You've got about a 7,500-foot cabin, very much like your high-performance single-engine airplane or non-pressurized twin. You load the, in things you that aren't subject to having a problem due to cold or non-pressurization, such as coats and publications and other things. So maybe going from a nice cold climate down to a warm place on a vacation, get in the airplane, leave your jackets that you don't need where you're going to Florida or someplace out in the wing locker. And then, of course, when you get home, you want to carry them in the airplane if you're stepping out into 10 degrees weather, but you don't need them when you're stepping out into 80 degree weather. Okay, let's go outside now and show you some of the features that I alluded to earlier and take a look around the airplane. We're looking at the engine. There's the Albuquerque Mountains in the background, the Continental TSI 0520 NV, 335 horsepower. The scoop is part of the intercooler. With the Ram 7, you have a larger intercooler and turbocharger, which gives you good high altitude performance, rate of climb to get up to some altitudes. Again, you can see the hydraulic gear. All you're seeing is the gear style. But with the wet wing system, the inner gear door, that would be the door normally under the wing stub that has to open and close has been eliminated. So that's why we have the gear speeds, VLO operating and VLE extension, 176. Put them out and leave them out because we don't have that inner gear door that if it gets bent or torqued, you wouldn't be able to operate the gear. And it's just a blowdown system. If this airplane went over your head and you looked up, you'd see the tire because there's no, again, door that has to open. It just drops. Okay, nice long wing, the longest of any twin Cessnas. Three-bladed heater Macaulay propeller. 76-inch disc. You can see it also goes right over the prop wash, goes right over the horizontal stabilizer. Gives you an excellent feel on takeoff. Landing, you don't need a lot of speed before your elevator yoke pitch is alive and a good feeling all the way to the flare to the ground. But you're seeing what we call the wing stub or the inner wing and then the outer wing. Really pretty airplane, pretty background, good photo. Similar to the first image we had, but we can see a little bit more here. The large baggage nose carries, I think, 600 pounds. You'll bulk out before you weigh out. Again, look for a document that I'll be putting on the website called the Technical Data Sheet. The spec sheets and equipment list, we try to keep it current with hours and any equipment changes or dates. The annual is due on this airplane will be November of 2021, and it has a high useful load of almost 2,000 pounds, 1990. So even if you put 1,000 pounds of gas in it, 1,236 pounds is maximum fuel, which you don't need any more than you need a full tank of gas to go to the grocery store or take the kids to school. You don't have to have a full tank of gas to go someplace. Okay, so we put 1,000 pounds of gas on, we'd have 990 pounds of payload, people in bags. Taxi light on the nose, that operates separate from the landing lights, which come down out of the outer wing. It would have been a tip on the tip tank if it had tip tanks. Great visibility, side windows, five on each side. Oh, it's very open, non-claustrophobic for passengers. You don't feel like this is a tiny airplane. Once you give some people who may be a little general aviation gun shy riding this thing, the line will be long to fly from your home base to wherever it's going. Pull your car up to the door, security, that's you. Polish spinner, good paint. Again, part 135 maintained, so it's not optional. Do service bulletins, they're required. 
great visibility for pilot and co-pilot, large wind windows or sh windshields, and then the pilot's windshield's heated in the side windows also. Pretty airplane, I think the colors are, it's a white, kind of looks a little beige here, but it's white with uh, red accents. Nice long wing, 206 gallons, 1600 hour TVO on the motors. A little close up of what we talked about. You can see the electrically heated pilot's windshield, side window, five windows on each side, 335 of horsepower Ram engine. This airplane has Vortex generators, hard to see in this picture, but the little right angle pieces of metal right at the hinge line on the rudder and the vertical stabilizer. Three bladed Macaulay heated prop. So this airplane certified no one ice. The boots on the entire airplane, the tail, the appanage vertical and horizontal, inner and outer wing, heated propellers, heated pilot's windshield, heated PDOT static stall, heated fuel vents, ice detection light, which you can't really see very well in this picture, but it shines out on the left boot at night. The assumption is if there's ice on one wing, good chance it's on the other wing. Vernon Aviation, that's the 135 operator in Farmington. That'll come off, it's a decal, and even if it was painted, we can sand that off and reshoot it. There's the vortex generator on the wing stub. You're looking forward here now. I'm sorry, looking aft. Let me orient, orient myself. Yeah, we're looking aft. And then on the vertical tail also. They make it a safer twin. They do reduce takeoff and landing distance. They enhance takeoff and landing distance. They're not a stall system, so don't start thinking that. But they make it a safer twin. Wouldn't have a twin without them, and probably I'm going to guess 98% of twin systems have vortex generators on them. Here we see the nice long wing and boot. There you can see the little ice detection light, that little light, right, light at the end of the boots there. Again, five windows on each side. You see the clamshell door. Look at the pilot side windows, front and back, front and side. Excellent visibility, real great visibility. Smooth bonded wing. There's not a lot of rivets. It's called the bonded wing. When I worked for Cessna as a young guy in 76 and used to give factory tours at Citation in the 400 series and 300 series lines, production lines, we would see these wings on a cart. It remind you of loaves of bread at a bakery going into the oven. You'd roll them in. These carts were real long. We shoved it into an autoclave that baked the composites, and it's actually stronger than metal. So if you look on the wings, when they're nice and washed and waxed, it looks very glassy. It's a polished, wet wing. 206 gallons, 103 on each side, 1,236 pounds, lots of gas, lots of gas. Here we're looking a little bit from the right side of the airplane. Again, great visibility. You can see the prop wash going over the horizontal stabilizer. Landing gear, it's a wide stance gear. It's the widest of any of the twin Cessnas. What this means is let's just take a worst case scenario. You gotta land on the short runway, and it's a narrow runway. Most short runways aren't gonna be a wide runway. It's not logical. Short runway, narrow runway, we got a crosswind. So we're gonna get our speeds down, head out of the cockpit, know our speeds. Coming in steep, we don't want to drag this one in. Minimum speed, power, carrying power, and looking outside, and then crosswind, drop that one wing into the wind, and as soon as that other main touches down, immediately drop the other wheel, get it on the ground, and start effective braking. That nice wide stance gear doesn't get too antsy, like some airplanes where the gear is in real close, including Cessna singles. Cirrus would be another example. Mitsubishi turboprop. Lots of baggage up in the nose, radar dishes up in the nose. See the taxi light on the nose gear. Again, you see how long the wing is. Even the camera couldn't keep up with it in this case. There you see the outer gear door, which you can't hurt that one. That's bolted on. It's the inner gear door, which is not on this airplane. That again allows for the high gear speeds and a blowdown system. Don't let that long nose intimidate you. I'm not a tall guy, but I adjust my seat, and you don't even see it. I've got many, many hours in the 400 series, long nose, 421. C, 421B even, and the 402s and the 414A Chancellors, you won't see it, doesn't bother you. Great visibility, really enjoy the Chancellors. Here you can see the vortex generators right on the hinge line, huge vertical fin, 50% of it is rudder, big rudder, gives you excellent yaw control on crosswind taxi and takeoffs and single engine practice and operations, and a huge trim tab. So let's just say you and I decide to go fly, we're going along in cruise, got about 65% power, and then I gently pull back the right engine, the airplane's gonna yaw to the right, and it's going to, our job, you're gonna reach up there, with, not reach there, but you're gonna press on that 
pedal to get it straightened out. And that huge barn door of a rudder is going to help you. Then you're going to go to that big trim tab and trim out your pressures. And you'll have a nice docile big airplane on one engine. And then as we get close to landing, maybe half mile out, three quarters of a mile out. Now this is my technique. It's not a law of the land. It's not POH. It's not federal law. My technique is to get rid of the trim. I like to, if you'll excuse the word, fight at the last half mile or so, so I have a good feeling on landing. And as I pull the throttles off, it doesn't yaw on a narrow runway because we've got so much rudder trim in there. Excellent paint, modern scheme. Fully booted, you can see the boot on the vertical. Here we get a good chance to see that wide stance gear again. Great pilot visibility, fully booted inner and outer wing, three-bladed and heated propellers going over the prop, prop wash, going over the horizontal surfaces. Really nice shot, nice shot. All the blades are in sequence. Sounds like when it was running, the props would be synced up. Hydraulic landing gear, lots of baggage up in the nose, in the wing lockers, which are non-pressurized, and then things like food, toys, games, computers inside the cabin. We got wing locker storage. I think it's 200 pounds on each side. There is no in the cell tanks or behind the engines on Chancellors. The decision was made in production that the 206 gallons was adequate for the average pilot. Aftermarket tanks could be installed in this cavity that you see right here. Gives you some additional fuel. I think they're 18.5 each, and you, know, you could put in this airplane. You could actually put up to four in, two forward and two aft, but you'd be now flying seven, eight hours. I don't think you need that to go to most places. Material in the cab and the wing lockers can be replaced. It gets dirty. That's where you're throwing stuff. And let's summarize 1981 414A in New Mexico. That's not exactly a wet climate. Farmington, you go to Albuquerque, rent a car, drive over, we'll work something else out. 1600 hour engine. These engines have a little under 1200 hours, maintained at part 135. The annual inspection is due in November of the year 2021 almost a 2,000 pound useful and about a 1,000 pound a payload with full gas. Graphic engine monitor, vortex generators. Oh, also has these little things called wheel covers. They're kind of like wheel covers, like kind of like hubcaps if you want to think of them that way. So when the gear is tucked up, there's a little better flow across it. I'm not a big fan of it. I wouldn't buy them. I think they're three or $4,000, but they're there. Take advantage, they're there, they'll be like anything else. It's on the airplane, it's not going away. Certified for flight and no one icing, backup oxygen system, the cell fire system, which is, was an option. Upper and lower cabin door extenders, full instruments for pilot and co-pilot. 750, 650, it's ADS-B. We have a traffic system, the GDS-800, which I couldn't show you because it's not visible, but it displays. The Garmin Modern Radar, the King Radar Altimeter, and the King DME, I still like to have those. Good at DME, I still like looking at the DME in my radar altimeter on approach. Altitude alerter pre-select, and it has Bluetooth on the Garmin flight stream. Not too much not to like. They did good placarding and cutting of the metals when they redid the avionics. Part 135 maintained, professionally flown. So if you have any questions, of course, you're on my website, jerrytemple.net. Can't be easier, myname.net. Look under the area called Temple's Tips. These are articles I've written over the years. Look under Buyer Services. Read the outline titled Domestic Sales Procedures. It's the steps we try to follow. Look at Seller Services if you have airplanes that perhaps need to be sold. Look over every area of the website. Of course, call us, discuss it. We'll answer questions as best we can. Thank you very much. Enjoy talking to you and look forward to talking to you some more. Thank you.